Lord Mark. Luke. We'll actually be here and in First John this morning. Let's start in John. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him not anything was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome. Pray together and we'll start. Father, how many fathers would give up their sons? How many kings would give up their thrones? None of us. None of us would give our son, even for each other, much less for our enemies. As we enter this time of Advent, Lord, as we enter this time of celebrating the incarnation of God, as we enter this time of celebrating that Word became flesh, as we enter this time of loving one another as Christ has loved us, may you remind us, Lord, this morning and throughout this month as we celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That the cross of Christ was his purpose. That the reconciliation of man to God was his goal. And the foundation of his life was the glory and praise of his Father. So Father, now take us and use us as we open your word. Edify your church. Build them up, Father, to live according to your word. Father, I would even pray this morning that sinners who are unredeemed this morning, who are not born again, that the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, would compel them, would remove the blinders from their eyes and open their hearts to receive and believe the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, just like you've done with so many of us, even as I preach this morning. Thank you for this time. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for having me back this morning. You are a lively church, and I am so thankful for your worship, Pastor. That was a wonderful and amazing, uh, holy moment, lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. As he was sharing about what God was doing in him, I thought, I've got to get him up in this pulpit and have him do some preaching. Because I was ready to listen to more about what God has done in his life. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And the Word was with God, excuse me, and the Word was God. Before creation, before anything was spoken into existence, Christ was. He is eternal. He was before and he'll be after. After this world is gone, burned up, the last day he will reign. God did not create the Son. He did not speak Jesus into existence. Jesus was and is and forever shall be. Amen. So John says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were all in fellowship together before any of us were around. Before Adam, before Eve, before the stars, before the sun, before the planet, before the space, before the universe, they were together and perfect. Nothing was missing, nothing could be added to them to make them more complete. They were in perfect harmony. God was. 
yet. We also know in the beginning of our Bibles that in the beginning, God created. He spoke us into existence. By the very word of Christ, the stars, the sun, the moon, the earth, all of our planets, everything in the known universe and beyond, in an instant was created. That's the power of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit working together. I've spent a little time trying to create things before. I've spent a little time trying to raise some chickens and some cows, and none of them happened in an instant. I wish they did. Business might have gone uh, a little bit more profitable had I been able to save chicken and a chicken <laughs> pop out of nowhere. That's not how it works. There's a process. Yet with God, in the beginning, He spoke, and it was. Hold your place in John chapter 1 and turn to the book of 1 John chapter 2. The book of 1 John has been through the decades called the litmus test or the revealing test of what Christianity looks like lived out on a daily basis. It shows us what a Christian's heart should be inclined towards when it comes to the one another's with each other. Because we know that Christianity is not just a vertical relationship. It is a horizontal relationship. And in the book of John, we find that God became man. Word was become flesh. In the book of 1 John chapter 2, we find out why the Word became flesh. Read with me, if you will, 1 John chapter 2. My little children, I am writing these things so that you may not be in sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have an advocate in our guilt proclaiming a righteousness that is foreign to our own. Maybe some of you this week were upset like I was about a not guilty verdict in California where a woman was murdered and all the evidence seemed to point to a certain man and he was found not guilty in her murder. And if you're anything like me, when you hear such of an injustice, there begins to well up within you an anger of, God, why would you let such a vicious and guilty man off? Why would you allow him to be declared not guilty? Why would you do such a thing, God? What were those people Thinking, What was the prosecutor and the defender and the jury and the judge? Couldn't they see that all the evidence pointed to being guilty as sin? And you begin to think, this world is not just. This world is not fair. There is a family that's in mourning. And now, by all the evidence, her murderer will walk free. And because of the ways that our laws are set up in this country, he won't be tried again for murdering her. And in our prayer time, we might say, why, God? <laughs> what are you doing in this kind of instant? Well, after the anger may well up in you, <coughs> hopefully the God of the universe who spoke you into existence will give you mercy and remind you you stood just as guilty as that murderer. Break one part of the law and you are guilty of breaking what? All. The all, whole, every bit of the law. 
Our Lord Jesus in the gospel says, if you are guilty of hating a brother in your heart, you are guilty of murder. All of us stand condemned like that man. Yet, read what John says. I am writing these things to you that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, what does he say? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. God is sitting on His righteous throne, judging perfectly and in all holy, holy, holiness and righteousness, and you stand and I stand condemned in His presence. We are unable to stand in His presence. Sin is crushed in His presence. Yet, when we sin, we have an advocate. Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is standing at the right hand of God, pleading for you His righteousness on your behalf. That is the purpose and the goal of the incarnation, of Advent season, of Christmas. The babe in the manger came so that he might die and stand and advocate for you. Have you had an advocate before? I remember having advocates when I was younger, growing up, and I would do something that was wrong. I remember in fifth grade, I remember it like it was yesterday because it was a traumatic experience for me. But me and two girls in my class, we were very good friends. And I was a lot of trouble in school. I had the gift of gab. And I liked to talk a lot in class. And a teacher, for some reason, I don't know why, but thought if she would move me around different places, maybe I would hush more. But all that did was give me more people to talk to. <laughs> Thank you for giving me more friends. <laughs> I'm so thankful. And these two girls and I were especially close. I have uh, I had a bit of a crush on one, and, and my friend had a bit of a crush on the other. And we were doing, in class, a thing called, you remember Mad Libs? Remember the Mad Lib books where there were a little story and you got to fill in words and they were always just crazy words, you know, because they'd say, give me a noun and you'd say puppy or, or president or whatever. You'd say, give me a verb and you'd say uh, diving and the sentence would end up saying like the puppy is diving into the mashed potatoes, right? It would just be insanity. But as 10-year-old boys and 10-year-old girls tend to do sometimes, we thought it would be fun to make words that weren't necessarily appropriate for 10-year-old boys and 10-year-old girls to say. Swear words, if I can say that from a pulpit. We would write in swear words. And we would pass these papers back and forth throughout class. Well, at one point, because of my sinful talking during class, I got moved to the other side of the room. And the girl, I remember her name was Mitzi, she decided that it was important enough for me to see the hilarious thing that they had created. So during class, she got up from her desk with the paper in hand, walked all the way across the room, like no one in the world could see her, <laughs> and handed me the paper, which was, at that time, hilarious. I thought it was the funniest thing in the world. And when I get to laugh, and have you ever been in a place where you're not supposed to laugh? <laughs> ever been in that place before? I get the giggles sometimes, and I'm not supposed to have them. And I can't help it. I remember, you know, being a pastor, I do a lot of preaching, and I do funerals sometimes, and uh, I remember preaching a funeral with two of my favorite ministers, all three of us were preaching, and the one who was doing most of the preaching was my mentor, and then the two acolytes were sitting down, and um, uh, I would tell you the names, but I don't want to embarrass them, or at least one of them, and me and my colleague got, I don't know what happened. I don't know if he stepped on my foot or if he hit me with his knee or what, but we got to the point where we wanted to have a giggle sitting in front of a couple of hundred people. 
morning, right? So that's what I'm telling you is sometimes I get a giggle and it's not the best place. Well, I get to giggling as she hands me this paper because she just kind of struts across the school, the, the, the classroom, and obviously the teacher sees what's going on, just kind of sits there watching it unfold. Well, in her mind, kids pass notes and their notes like, hey, do you like me? Check yes, check no, right? Those are the kind of notes that 10-year-old that boys and girls pass. Well, this was a confidential letter <laughs> that should have been top secret. And she says, Bryce, bring up the letter that you have just received. I'm a spy and I've been caught. Because my partner in crime had no uh, idea that she was apparently visible to God and everyone. <laughs> so I say, what, what? You know, you act dumb at the beginning. I, I, I couldn't hear you. I'm all the way in the back. You moved me to the back of the room. I, I, could you speak up? She says, bring the paper up here. Okay. Slowest walk in history. <laughs> The, the gallows are coming, destruction is coming, I know what's coming. And I take it up, and she looks at it. And I have to say now that in my mind, she probably thought it was hilarious, but obviously a teacher can't say that. You know, they can't say, this. these swear words that you 10-year-olds have written are hilarious. You guys just keep doing that, right? No, we ended up getting sentenced to... Two weeks of no recess, meaning we had to be in the room writing on the wall, I will not write profanity in class. I will not write profanity in class. I will not write profanity in class. Thousands of times. My arm was just useless. After that. But I remember about a week and a half into our punishment, the principal happened to stop by the room and saw that we were doing that. And she was a really, really uh, generous and nice woman. And she went to bat for us. And she pleaded a case to our teacher, Mrs. Orchard, and she said, how long have they been in punishment? And she said, uh, seven or eight days, school days now. And she pled our case. And I don't know if it was because of her position as principal over teacher, but our teacher relented and we were able to go outside the rest of the days and have recess. Jesus Christ in heaven is pleading your case before God. Except he's not pleading that you deserve a release from heaven. He's not pleading that you deserve less punishment. He's pleading, as John says here, look what he says. He's, we have an advocate with the Father. He's advocating. Who is advocating? Jesus Christ, the righteous. What he is doing is if another student in my class would have said, Mrs. Orchard, can I write those sentences for Bryce and for Elizabeth? And for Mitzi, I'm not kidding, I remember it like it was yesterday. And I can see us doing those things. It was that big in my life at the time. Someone else coming along and saying, I'm not guilty of this. Can I take the punishment? Except it's not Jesus asking. It was the plan of the Father from the beginning. You have an advocate, I have an advocate, knowing full well that you would be a rebellious, um, contentious, sinning, overwhelmingly sinful person, guilty of murder in your heart. And Jesus Christ, the righteous, advocates for you. Verse 2 says, He is the propitiation for our sins. Big word. Not a lot of people think on this word too much, but it is the foundation of what happened on the cross. Propitiation means the absolving or the relenting of the wrath of God. You see, somewhere along the line in Christianity, it's been 
twist it a little bit, that when you're in hell, it's Satan that is punishing you. It's absolutely false. The lake of fire was created for Satan. That's what the Bible says. He is there when the judgment comes, being punished for his rebellion. If people are there, it's not Satan punishing them. He's being punished as well. So who is it? It's a holy God. The Bible says that the wrath of God is stored up for the unrighteousness of man. And what Jesus Christ has done is absorbed the wrath of God destined for you. He took the punishment. He allowed himself, according to the great purpose of the triune God, to be destroyed on the cross, basically, in order that the wrath of God would be appeased. Because God is angry at sin. We don't serve a flighty kind of, you know, uh, a parent who lets their child get away with everything. That's not the God we serve. It's not the God we worship. God pours out His wrath on sin and sinners. And if He doesn't do it in hell, it's because He did it on the cross. So John says, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He is the wrath bearer. He is the punishment taker. Don't think that's a light sentence. Don't think that that's not a huge statement. That the perfect, unblemished, holy, sinless God of Jesus, the person of Jesus, was slaughtered for us. It's one of the reasons we decorate in red. To commemorate not just a baby, a manger, but the bloody execution of our Lord. Keep reading. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is John not just reminding us that we have uh, that we have our own sins taken care of. Well, I'm okay, so therefore, I don't have to worry about anything anymore. John here is reminding us that your sins, Christian, have been forgiven. You are the elect, you are the forgiven, you are the chosen, you've been forgiven. He reminds us to be on mission here, and I love, by the way, that you hand out the 2017 week of prayer for international missions. I love churches that pray for missions around the world because you're following the argument here that John is giving, not only for your sins, but for the sins of the whole world. We have a mandate in that sentence to share the gospel, to preach the gospel, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth starting with our dinner table to tell people about the Advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. It's not just for you and me, folks. It's not just for this room. It's for the entire world to hear. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue, everywhere, everyone needs to hear the Gospel. What they do with that gospel is between them and a holy God. You're no more concerned with actually getting them to convert than I am or than we were in our own salvation. We, we, we didn't open up the eyes of our hearts. We sang it last week. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. It's not the work you're doing. We're not going to be boasting in heaven. We're, we're not. But we will be praised in heaven when God says, well yeah. done, yeah. good and faithful servant. 
You took that gospel that I gave you that changed your life and you took it into your neighborhood and you took it into your city. You even went to the wicked west side and preached to those demons over there and you, 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 you took the gospel everywhere in order that people might have a chance to believe and be saved. Boy, that's what I want to hear. I want to hear God say, very well, good and faithful servant. You were obedient Keep reading. So not only for our sins, but also the sins of the whole world. Verse 3, And by this we know that we have come to know Him. You want to know if you're a Christian? John is about to answer that question. Am I saved? Am I a believer? Am, do I have relationship? Is Jesus Christ my uh, advocate, am I born again? Here's his answer. I hope you're ready. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Forever, or excuse me, whoever, verse 4 says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments. What is he? He's a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. Now, we have to do some theological work here. If we take that statement and we just yank it out of the Bible and we say something to the effect of, if you keep His commandments perfectly all the time, every moment of every day, only then are you saved, we're teaching heresy. We have to put the Bible in context and in the overall context of the whole Bible. But even in just this paragraph, because look what he says. Remember in verse 1 of chapter 2? My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anybody does sin, you have an advocate. So now we have to, have to deal with some tension here. Because in the beginning he says, if you do sin, and the implication there is you're going to sin. If you're going to... Christmas is coming. <laughs> it's been a volatile political year. Not everybody agrees politically right now. And for some reason, we love to shout it, right? We, we love to argue those things. <laughs> Thankfully, my Thanksgiving was political less. We didn't talk about anything political at Thanksgiving. We talked about being thankful, we talked about our family. Talked about how thankful we are to be together. I was amazed. My mother and I don't see eye to eye on some political things, and we're both bold <laughs> in our uh, speaking sometimes. I blame her. I mean, I got it from her, right? So. Christmas is coming, and you're going to be tempted to sin against your neighbor or your wife or your husband or your uncle who has crazy views politically, right? You're, you're, you're going to be tempted to argue. It's a good thing that when you do, you have an advocate. So, the writer here is assuming that you're going to be breaking some of the commandments. <coughs> How many of you broke any of the ten? You don't have to raise your hands. All public shame. How many of you broke any of the ten commandments just driving to church this morning? You covet a car that you saw driving by you? I've been in that position before. You know, I've got a pretty nice truck. It's a few years old, but it runs really well. And it does exactly what I need it to do, which is take me and some things to another place, right? That's what vehicles are supposed to do. But the other day I saw that Ford, and I have a Chevy, but I like Fords too. I'm not one of the people that don't like it both, you know, or whatever. But I saw that they've made a $100,000 truck. And I thought, boy, that'd be something. <laughs> Pull up as a preacher in a $100,000 truck. I may not get invited back. <laughs> what are they paying that for? But I kind of covet sometimes. Just broke one of the Ten Commandments. Right? You covet. So we may have broken one of the Ten Commandments on the way to church. We may be breaking it right now. Instead of listening to me, you're thinking about something that you want that somebody else has. Maybe you're thinking some jealous thoughts. 
You're jealous of somebody doing something that you want to do? Maybe you're harboring some anger in your life towards a brother or a sister and you're not ready to let that go? Maybe you don't like somebody because of the way they've treated you. Maybe you, you have some hatred and some anger in your heart. I'm talking to you, believer. Maybe there's something storing up within you and you haven't confessed it. You haven't re re released it to the Lord. You haven't asked God to forgive you for it. You're in sin. So the first verse is absolutely true. When we do sin, it's going to happen. So we have to take verse 1 and put it together with verse 6. Excuse me, verse 5. Whoever keeps his word in him truly, the love of God is perfected. Well, how do we keep his word if we're going to break his word? What's, what's the deal? We have to go back to the beginning again. Verse 1, the last part. We have an advocate. Would I sin willfully against a holy God? I have an advocate. And I am jealous of another pastor because he's better doing something than I am. I have an advocate. And I'm angry that something happens that shouldn't to children or to whomever. And I let that anger lead into sin because it's possible to be angry and not sin. We know that because the Bible says it. But a lot of the time our anger does lead to sin. I'm working with a couple right now. and uh, do a lot of marriage counseling. And uh, the husband is a very angry man. Very angry. thrown things before, not at his wife, but across the room. He's letting his anger sin in him. We're not better than him, are we? In the same position. Some of us just manage it a little bit better. So when we break the commandment, we have an advocate on your behalf saying, he's mine. She's mine. My righteousness covers him. My righteousness covers her. So when you break the commandment, you are forgiven positionally. But what does that push the believer to do? It pushes us, as Paul would say in Corinthians, to a godly remorse that leads to repentance and love. It is impossible for a Christian to live a long period of time without being repentant. If you are in that category, I would say to you today to examine yourself and your salvation. Because if your life isn't one marked by repentance from a standing of being forgiven by God, Because in America, it's easy to look the part. Right? All I had to do this morning was put on a suit and show up. You don't know my heart. You don't know any of that stuff. I could be the biggest fake in the world. Right? Even for 21 years now. <laughs> it would probably be really <laughs> difficult. <laughs> But I bet you could do it. <coughs> Christians, when we break the commandments, are not disproving that we're born again. We're proving that we have an advocate. <coughs> so look what he says. By this we know that we are in him, verse 6. Whoever says he abides in him ought great word, ought. Ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So there's another commandment. It's an ought. 
You ever have somebody give you some oughts? <coughs> you oughta, right? We don't use the Bible term, we use the Southern Indiana term. You oughta. You oughta, you oughta wash your car more often, right? So you oughta wax it because it's going to rust. You oughta vacuum your floor. You oughta keep your dog from trying to kill my cat. You oughta, you oughta, right? This is John's yada. Whoever says he abides in him. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about all of us who claim the name of Christian. He's talking about all of us who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ to be our advocate. To be who he says he is to us. He, we, we, are, we are claiming that we belong to Jesus Christ. If you do, you ought to walk in the same way in which you walk. Now, church, how do we learn to walk as Jesus walked? Through Scripture. You study the Word. You open it up. You read it together as a family, as a church, as small groups. I heard this morning you guys are going through the book of Acts. What a great book to go through on Sunday mornings in Sunday school. What an awesome thing to learn about the apostles, how they lived taking the gospel. Because you know what their example was? The Lord Jesus Christ. So as a church, together, what you're doing is you're doing the auto. You're doing, you ought to walk the way he walked because you're studying how he walked by studying his apostles. <coughs> and you know what? When you get done with the book of Acts, however long that takes, those of you who paid attention and applied it to your life and asked the Holy Spirit of God to fill you and to work in you, you're going to walk a lot more like Jesus. That's how it works. In fact, in John chapter 17, which is the high priestly prayer of Jesus in the garden, before he's arrested, before he's abused, before he's beaten, before he's murdered on a cross, before he's buried, and before he's raised from the dead, he's in the garden weeping tears of blood, and he's pleading with God. And verse 17 of John chapter 17, and I'm sorry I'm off my notes, but we'll just kind of go with it. He says, sanctify them in the truth. And then he says, your word is truth. Now sanctify is a word that means less of you and more of Jesus. He's taken away your sin and he's making you look more like him. That's why... For those of you who've been saved for a few decades, you're not the same person that you used to be. Your life looks way different now than it did. You look different. It's awesome. You look great. Sanctify them in your truth. The word is truth. And that's what you're doing when you study the Bible. When you sit down and you put your nose to it and you say, these are the things that the Lord Jesus has said, and by the, the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to apply those and live out those implications. Just one before we leave. I think it's hard to see that clock. Uh, quarter till. Quarter till. You guys, we're about done. Right? Here. Let's just go to verse 7. I, we'll just, just, just look at this. Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it's a new commandment that I'm writing you, which is true in Jesus, or in Him, and in you, because the darkness is passing away, the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. You don't get any more black and white than that. If I am harboring hatred in my heart towards another brother or sister in Jesus Christ, that probably is an example of how my heart is either in rebellion towards God or not in God at all. God doesn't sit idly by while His children hate one another. He doesn't. He will make you as miserable as He can until you relent. God corrects His children. So 
Well, that's where we'll stop today. Whoever says he has or is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Folks, don't allow hatred during this, this season especially to rule in your heart. Yesterday I was driving, and I, I try not to drive in the busy intersections when it's super busy because I like to get where I'm going, and I don't like to sit behind lots and lots of cars. And especially during this season, everybody's in a hurry, and everybody's the most important, right? We're, 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 we're all the most important, and we all have to get to where we're going. And there's always so many horns, like just horns after horn after horn. Everybody's mad, and everybody is uh, uh, important, right? we got to go buy those gifts. We gotta get it going. It's a good litmus test for how your heart is. Somebody cuts you off in traffic. Or one of the things I love, you ever see them where the people who are turning and they more turn than they're supposed to, so they're out blocking the rest of traffic, right? That's a good heart test right there. My hand wants to lay on the horn. But what John says, if there's hatred in your heart, you're harboring hatred. You're still in darkness. What does that mean? What are the implications of that for you and your family? Is there a relationship that isn't right and you're one of the reasons? Are you withholding forgiveness from someone who has hurt you? Have you hurt someone and you haven't apologized? You know, the Bible says to keep your offerings that's the case. It says, leave your offering, go and make it right with your brother or your sister. <coughs> Hatred is a big deal with God. That's why I'm so encouraged to be in a church like this. Even the very front of your bulletin. It says, love Evansville. How I wish more of our churches had that attitude. How I wish more churches would follow John's advice when he says, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the entire world. Keck Avenue is a church that is concerned with the gospel gave to the entire world. But don't let the grand vision of getting the whole world the gospel pull you back from examining your own heart during this time. Allowing God to expose any sin that needs to be confessed. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, what's true of you is that the judgment and wrath of God still sits on your head. You currently don't have an advocate who is saying to God the Father, He's mine, she's mine. You sit outside the family of God. But thankfully, according to the Bible, all you need to do is believe and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord. You confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will be saved. There's no special prayer. There's no special service. There's just you and a holy God. And He's saying, come. He's saying, come to the Father through the Son with the compelling of the Holy Spirit. All three of them are involved in your salvation. And just as easily as in the beginning they spoke creation into existence, they can save you this morning. They're compelling you to come to believe in the Lord Jesus and be saved. Let's pray again. Our Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the book of 1 John. We thank you for the book of John. Thank you, Father, that your word is a great tool in your hands that rightly divides us down to our joints and our marrow and exposes our sinful hearts before a holy God. And thank you, Father, that we have an advocate who is Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the one who is our propitiation, 
who is our forgiveness, who is our substitute on the cross. Thank you, Father, that you gave up your Son because you love us so much. Father, I pray that you would encourage your church this morning. I pray that you would edify them as they seek to take the gospel to this world. And I pray, Father, that those here that have no relationship with Jesus, that you would call them to repentance and faith in your Son. We thank you, Father, for this time. We thank you for the name of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen.